Hello everyone, welcome to experimental biochemistry course. Now today we are going to study the spectroscopic techniques. The spectroscopic techniques required in detection and estimation of amino acids and proteins. Generally proteins have aromatic amino acid residues like tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine which can be detected using spectroscopic tools. About spectroscopic tools we have studied in your theoretical classes, there are broadly two types of basic spectroscopic techniques which are UV visible spectroscopy, second one is fluorescent spectroscopy. Apart from there are other types of spectroscopies which uh, we will uh, get to know after learning all this, but currently for this lab we will uh, get acquainted with UV visible spectroscopy and fluorescent spectroscopy. So let us start with our experimental methods. Before starting this experiment, we have to get acquainted with the instrument. Now let us see how the UV instrument looks. For UV visible spectroscopy, we need an UV instrument. Basically UV instrument are various types and one of these types is out here. This is the UV chamber basically and this UV chamber records the absorbance of samples of protein or amino acid samples and the chamber actually give result which can be detected using this uh, software. This computer gives a UV spectrum where we can see the absorbance values. Now let us now let us see how the UV chamber actually looks like. Well, this is the UV chamber. Now here it is the lead of the UV chamber. Here we can open this lead and inside we can see there are two compartments where we can place the UV cuvette. What is cuvette? We will come after this. So, this one is uh, compartment number 1, this one is compartment number 2 and out here the UV light will pass through this compartment in this direction and out here in this direction. So, here we will put our cuvette. So, again after putting the cuvette we will close this lead. For measuring the absorbance of a solution either protein or amino acid, we have to take the solution in a clean and washed cuvette. So what is a cuvette? You have seen in the theory classes that a cuvette is like a transparent glass material uh, where one side is frosted out here and the other side is uh, smooth. So basically this is the UV cuvette. So cuvettes are of various types, one is the glass cuvette, the other is the quartz cuvette. So it depends upon the quality. So, for glass cuvette and plastic cuvette what problem is that basically they are not transparent to all the light within the UV region. So, it, that percentage of transparency is not that much compared to quartz whereas in case of quartz it is although expensive but it is around 80 percent transparent to light in the region around 200 to 400 uh, wavelength. So, for that we are uh, advised to use the squares cuvette. So, before using the squares cuvette we have to note down a few points. Number one, do not touch this clean side or the smooth side of the UV quartz cuvette. So, for this UV quartz cuvette has two sides, one clean side and one frost side. So, when you are touching this, touch the frost side. So, what is the reason for bringing these two different sides? So, basically what happens during an UV light irradiation, the light enters from here and it passes out here. Sometimes actually the solution is there which is turbid. So, due to turbid solution scattering sometimes take place. So, if scattering occurs some light may be lost. So, as a result in order to prevent such loss of intensity the other two surfaces are made frost. So, we have to use a clean cuvette, do not touch a cuvette with bare hands always use a gloves for cuvette. When before using that clean this cuvette at least 3 to 5 times with double distilled water. I have just done it uh, right now and uh, try to make it dry. So, you can just invert it like this for a few minutes like keep it out here in a plate or something like that in a balance like this one. So, what will happen is that the water will come out of this and it will become dry. But generally this technique is not recommended, sometimes people use it is not recommended because it might contaminate the sides of this cuvette. So better keep this cuvette dry for some time, let it get dried in the air and start our experiment. Now let us start with uh, the UV experimental part, for that we have to do two steps, for that we have to follow two steps, number one is the baseline correction and number two we have to do the sample absorption. For baseline correction we need to uh, fill both the cuvettes with water and do the baseline. We will see it how it is done, but initially we have to fill this cuvette 
with the solution in which protein is dissolved. Basically, protein or amino acids are dissolved in uh, buffer or polar, polar solvents. Basically, those solvents should be such that it should mimic the biological uh, physiological pH. However, in this case, we are using double distilled water. As we know, the water is neutral for the time being. Uh, we are using double distilled water. So, let us fill this cuvette with water. Now, we have uh, now we can see that uh, we have filled around 50 percent of this cuvette with water. Now, we have to fill at least 70 to 78 uh, now we have to fill at least 70 to 75 or 80 percent of the cuvette with double distilled water. Now, we can clearly see here I am holding this frost side not the clear side out here. Now, we have taken this cuvette. Now, you will fill the other cuvette with 3 ml of double distilled water. Now, before taking this cuvette into the UV chamber, we have to uh, be sure that we clean this uh, both side of the cuvette with a clean uh, tissue paper. Now, we have to clean the clear side out here and here carefully. Be careful with the cuvette. Try not to like uh, put this cuvette here or there because a slight crack or slight uh, damage in this cuvette might change the intensity or might give incorrect results. Now, we have taken this uh, cuvette and uh, filled with double distilled water. This is the reference cuvette. We are filling the reference cuvette in this reference chamber and this is the sample chamber. Now, we are placing in such a way that this clear side faces the light. The light is passing from here to here so that it should go through this clear path. So, placing in this cuvette, uh, placing this cuvette in this chamber gently. Similarly, we are taking the reference cuvette this is a reference one we, it has been cleaned both sides and similarly we are facing it in such a way that the clear side is facing this light the light is entering from here and passing through here and filling in the reference part now let us move towards uh, analysis before that before uh, beginning with our experiment we have to just close this lid please note that do not keep this lid open while doing the experiment now, let us get uh, familiar with this software where we will measure the UV experiment. This is a UV probe software. Here, once you open this software, we can see various icons are there. No need to worry about all this. The main thing we need to bother out here are uh, this part and this method part given by M. Now, here we can see a graph is there. Here in the graph, this y axis is basically the absorbance part and the x axis is the wavelength part. Here we can see nanometer is given uh, 200 to 800 it is there. Now, if we want to change our requirement like suppose we do not need from 200 to 800 we need around 200 to 600 and we can how to change these things. Now, we have to go to a method out here. Here we can select the wavelength range. For a time being we do not need to bother about uh, 800 we need to do from 200 to 600. The scan speed, uh, the three types of scan speed out here fast, medium, slow, very slow. It is often recommended to go for slow to medium, not fast, but better to keep with medium. Now, the file name you should uh, go to the appropriate folder where you want to save. Currently, the file name we are bothered with is uh, out here this file nptl uv and the sample we are marking as s1 and open. Now, these are certain other instrumental uh, parameters which are default, which are better to be kept default. And uh, one thing out here is the slit width, it is kept 2 for this instrument. Now, let us press OK. Now, here we can see the wavelength range is up to 800 only, it has not been changed, although we had changed it to 600 but it will change once you start with the experiment. Now, let us get familiar with these icons. One is the auto zero and is the baseline and the start disconnect. So, disconnect appears because the machine is currently connected. Once we need to 
disconnect this machine from this CPU, then we need to press this one. For the time being, I have kept two qubits in this uh, chamber and now we will go to the baseline correction. So why baseline? Basically in order to uh, correct, in order to remove any error due to solvent or any error due to the background solvent, we have to do baseline. Now let us click this baseline. Here we are given the, the option that start 600 and end 200. Now it has by in default it has changed to 600 from 800. Now let us press OK. So the baseline correction will go by itself, nothing will come in this graph, it will take a bit time. So uh, for baseline correction we have to click this uh, baseline icon out here. It will show these two values uh, which we have set in the method part. It will start at 600 and end at 200. So the machine is being currently initialized for baseline correction. Here we can see gradually it has uh, started calibrating. Now it is taking individual wavelength like 300, 60, 50, uh, 40 like this one. While this is scanning we can see the other icons are currently disabled except the stop one. It is recommended not to open the slit during this initialization. The chamber should be closed while baseline correction is going on. Now it has done the baseline correction up to from 600 nanometer to 200 nanometer. And once the baseline correction is over, we can see that these icons appear once again. Now we are ready for sample analysis. Now we are done with the baseline correction, let us shift to the absorption spectra. We are beginning with uh, amino acid which is tyrosine. As we all know tyrosine is aromatic and it exhibits an aromatic uh, and due to aromatic group it exhibits an absorption spectra. For beginning with the absorption spectra we need to take out the reference qubit. Once we take out this reference qubit we will be adding 20 microliter of tyrosine solution. We have prepared a tyrosine solution, we will take 20 microliter of this tyrosine solution. Now for this what we need to do is that we need to take a pipette of 20 microliter with a clean tip, pipette out 20 microliter of the solvent or basically water out here. Now once we have pipetted out 20 microliter, we will be taking this tyrosine solution. 20 microliter tyrosine solution and we will be adding here. Once we have added here, we have to mix this solution, to mix it carefully. Note down that bubble does not appear here in the cuvet. Now why you have taken 20 microliter of solution and again added this 20 microliter because in the reference solvent it we have taken 3 ml of water. Now out here we have also taken 3 ml of water and done the baseline correction. Now once we have added this 20 microliter of tyrosine solution, the volume would change to 3, uh, 3 ml plus 20 microliter. So although this is not a major change but for spectroscopic uh, techniques, the small changes are reflected in the intensity of absorption. For that what we have done, we have taken 20 microliter out and again added this one in order to maintain the volume up to 3 ml. Now once we have done with this one, we will take again this solution and place it in the reference holder like the previous step where the clear side will be facing where the light will go uh, so that the absorption can take place. So we have seen the absorption spectra of tyrosine solution. Now from there what we can do, we can calculate the concentration of the tyrosine solution. For uh, evaluating the concentration, we have to follow the lambert beers law which we have studied in the theoretical class where absorption, uh, absorbance A equal to epsilon into C into L where epsilon is the molar absorption coefficient. Now what we need to know is that we need to know the molar absorption coefficient at a specific wavelength. For this we can know the molar absorption coefficient either at 275 or 278 or 280 whatever. If we know the molar absorption coefficient at a particular wavelength, we have to know the absorbance value at that particular wavelength. Now if we take the molar absorption coefficient at around 
275 nanometer we can't actually consider the absorption value at 278 nanometer for that we have to consider the molar absorption coefficient at 278 nanometer so the absorption value the absorbance value should corresponds to the molar absorption coefficient wavelength for this we can take the molar absorption coefficient at around 275 276 and uh, calculate the concentration from the lambert beers equation and from this sir, we can know what is the concentration of our stock tyrosine solution. Now the important part out here we have to save as a text file. For this one you have to again go to save as out here and the name will be same like this tyrosine solution. We have to go to save type out here. In the save type we have to click this one. Out here we can see various extensions are given. We have to go to this extension data print table dot txt and now we have to select this data print table extension out here we can see the type changes from dot spc to data dot txt and now we have to go to save what is the reason for this one because once we need to plot this graph in origin or excel whatever we want we need this text file for this we have to save as an extension of dot txt now click let us click save so once we have taken a spectra remember to save it as a, a system file and also as text file. So we are done with the absorption spectra for tyrosine. Now we will shift to another amino acid residue the tryptophan. But before that we have to take a clean cuvette once again. For this what we need to do we have to take the sample cuvette out here. We have to discard this solution in a waste beaker. Now we have to take again double distilled water and clean this one clean at least 5 to 6 times generally use this wash beaker having this water jet outlet and uh, one recommendation do not clean it with tap water because tap water will not clean this one rather it may <laughs> make it impure with other components which are not required. So I have washed it quite a few times. Now I will gently rub this outer side with a clean tissue paper. Whatever you do do not touch this clean side of the cuvette always hold the frost side. Now we will take again 3 ml of water in this solution and carry out with our next absorption spectra. Now we have poured again 3 ml we have poured 3 ml of double distilled water here in the cuvette. Now we will again dip it out 20 microliter of this one with the fresh tip. Now please do not use the tip we had used for tyrosine solution because the solution here we are using a tryptophan solution. So each time you take a new solution kindly change the tip. So I will take 20 microliter of this solution and again put it here a tip and mix it well. Please note a few things out here do not put the entire this tip out here in the solution just give 50 percent of the tip in the solution. Now let us see there are few bubbles out here we have to remove it. Now just touch with this tip the solution the, the bubble will be removed ok. So almost the bubbles are gone out here. Now let us proceed for this experiment. Now this case also we have taken the solvent as double distilled water. So in case of tyrosine solution the background is double distilled water for tryptophan also double distilled water. So we do not need to make another baseline. In the further experiments we will do for this lab we will do it as water as a solvent. Now we have taken the tryptophan solution in the sample holder. Now in the previous one we have uh, just clicked this start button. However in this case we can also start in the other way. 
here in this part we can see uh, the absorbance at around 600 nanometer is showing a value which is negative although this is not a negative one but however it has machine has calibrated it to be negative however we are all sometimes recommended to start from zero so machine should be calibrated to zero for this wavelength 600 nanometer for calibrating the machine to zero we have to do auto zero first we can do this is optional but it is recommended initially auto zero when we click auto zero we can see the change out here on the machine is calibrating it will take a bit time here we can see it has adjusted to zero value now no values or no other uh, numbers are coming out here here we can now start with the experiment now let's click start So we can't basically recognize out here. Once we uncheck this line here, we can see we have tariff in solution. Once we uncheck this line, here we can see the gradual uh, appearance of tariff in spectra. Currently, the spectra is not here; it is scanning. Here we can see uh, there is a peak rises out here. Followed by the other two peaks. Now the, now the machine has done with the absorption part. What we can see out here, uh, this one is one peak and this is the other peak. So basically what happens, this peak is generally for the peptide bond, you know, it take place for the peptide bond and this one is for the aromatic part. So here we can just click, uh, we can take this uh, bar and place it out here. Here we can see around 279 or rather around 280 or 279 we can see a ma absorption maxima appears out here. So what is absorption maxima? Absorption maxima is basically the maximum, the absorption maxima is basically the wavelength where we can calculate the maximum. What is absorption maxima? Absorption of maxima is actually the wavelength where the absorption intensity is maximum. However, one uh, thing we can notice out here is that the absorption maxima intensity out here you can claim it to be the maximum. But currently we are considering the aromatic part which generally gives absorption in this region 278 to 280 region. So this part will be calculated here as absorption maxima. So here we can see the absorption value that is 0 0.028. Now we have to save this data once again. For this, we will go to file, save as, now here we have to save it as TRP, that is tryptophan solution. The initial type will be system file, save. Now again we have to go here, save as, the second save will be done in text format, tryptophan solution, save. Now let us compare between tryptophan and tyrosine solution out here if we click this tyrosine part here we can see this is a tyrosine and this is tryptophan two things to note down from here before that 
what we need to do we need to this uh, enhance this part for this we have to change the scale for this we can change it to the scale the value which is around 0.2 so we can change it to 0.2 thus we can actually clearly see the values out here a few things to note from tyrosine and tryptophan absorbance is that the tyrosine absorbs around here the maximum for tyrosine as we can see it's around 270 value is around 274 to 75 whereas the maximum value for the blue one tryptophan is around 280 so there is a shift in the absorbent value and apart from that we have taken almost a similar concentration of tyrosine and tryptophan actually the prepared solution was quite similar concentration however the intensity of tryptophan is much higher than that of tyrosine residue now we have seen various uh, absorption spectra for tyrosine solution and tryptophan solution now this solution solely contains tyrosine residues or tryptophan residues when we will shift to protein so what is protein protein is basically a mixture of amino acid residues it composed of different amino acid residues so apart from tyrosine or tryptophan various uh, other amino acid like lysine arginine leucine isoleucine etc might be there in the protein so what the, the absorption spectra will look for a protein which have amino acids other than tyrosine and tryptophan present in it so you have to find out the spectra of defined protein solution now the protein having a tyrosine residues might not match with the conventional tyrosine residues the tyrosine residue spectra which you have uh, seen just here might not match with the protein which are having only tyrosine residues or because other residues might act over it, it the spectra might uh, be same or might differ a bit however the absorption maxima is expected to remain the same however on the other hand the tryptophan residue the spectra for the tryptophan residue might not match with the protein which are having tryptophan residues because the protein having a tryptophan residue might also have tyrosine residues so what is the conclusion out here so the conclusion out here is that the spectra we are seeing here in this conventional tyrosine or tryptophan uh, solution might or might not match with the protein which are having multiple tyrosine or single or multiple amino acid residues in it so let's see we define proteins which are having tryptophan and some and having tyrosine some are having a mixture of this aromatic residues and see how the resorption looks like so let's start with a protein solution the first protein solution we will use is ribonuclease a rna uh, the feature of rna is that it has only tyrosine residues it has basically six tyrosine residues and no tryptophan residues so again we have uh, taken this cuvet and washed it properly with double distilled water filled it with uh, 3 ml of double distilled water here now we will again pipette out 20 microliter of the solution and take RNAs A I have taken 20 microliter RNAs A and now I will add this in this cuvette and again mix it properly like the previous solutions kindly note mm, that bubbles are not present out here once you are done with it clean this clear side of this cuvette with tissue paper and again let's keep it in the reference compartment so we have taken um, RNA solution in the cuvette and let's uh, start this experiment before that let's click on auto zero this clicking on auto zero will change this uh, the absorbent value at around 600 nanometer to 0 so it is again 0 now let's start here we can see the experiment has completely started it has started scanning
here we can see appearance of a peak a small hump is there the absorption maxima out here is around 277 277 278 nanometer so this is for rnsa now we have to save this one once again save as rnsa solution 1 and again let's save it as a data file now as we have uh, said earlier that RNSA has only tyrosine residues, so let us compare with the tyrosine solution. Here we can see this is a tyrosine solution and this one is the red one is for RNSA, the black one is for tyrosine solution. Now let us uh, put a proper scale and compare it. Here, here we can see Basically, the intensity might differ because the concentration might be different in uh, for pure tyrosine solution and RNSA. However, one important thing to note down out here is that the tyrosine residue gives an absorption maxima at around 274 or 275 nanometer, whereas it changes slightly by 2 to 3 nanometer in case of RNSA, which gives an absorption value of around 277 or 278. So, what uh, concludes from this experiment is that due to presence of other amino acid residues in RNSA, the absorption spectra might differ a bit but not that much. The absorption maxima is still almost the same. Now if we compare with the tryptophan, it has a large intensity, let us change it to 0.2. Okay. Now comparing with tryptophan, we can see uh, it is highly different from this tryptophan residue uh, absorption spectra. So, this is generally for tyrosine residues. Now, let us come to another protein. So, we are done with the RNSA absorption spectra. Now, shifting to another protein, this is the serum albumin, one of the very common serum albumin known as human serum albumin, broadly known as HSA. So, in HSA, we have one tryptophan residues. So, after tyrosine residue protein, now let us see how a protein with a tryptophan residue gives an absorption spectra. Now, we will keeping this in the sample compartment. Now, we have taken the solution in this UV chamber. Here we can see it is almost 0, but we can again do an auto 0 correction. Now, the intensity is quite high. So, we will change the scale and see how it looks. Do not touch or do not stop this one until and unless the machine, the, uh, the experiment is over. So, here we are changing the scale to 0.5. Now, first before analyzing, let us save this one. Save as HSA solution 1 in the spectrum file extension and again we will take it and save as data printable format save now let us uh, scroll this bar and see here we can see the absorption maxima is around 278 and it is around 0.218 absorption maxima however coming to this only tryptophan solution here we can see the tryptophan solution gives around a broad peak out here but however in case of protein the nature of the peak slightly changes not that much however the absorption maxima remains almost same with plus minus 1 change in its lambda max value this plus minus 1 change is quite uh, is in the error range so no need to bother much about that I have a few things to note down from here is that this is the spectrum for our HSA solution now if we compare between HSA and RNSA solution here we can see the solution the two spectra varies how it varies number one is that the peak uh, the absorption peak is not that prominent out here 
as compared to this one. This might be caused due to two reasons. Number one, now here we can see the two absorption spectra. One is for the blue line, the two absorption spectra, the upper part is for HSA, the lower one, the red one is for RNSA. Now we can see basically the two absorption spectra have different characteristic. Number one, the intensity varies. Number two, the lambda max for both of them shifts a bit uh, up and down the wavelength series. So why? Basically why there is a difference? Number one is that a simple answer is that two different proteins are of course uh, have two different properties and different amino acid residues are pre present in two different proteins. That is why the absorption spectra varies. Yeah, it is right one. But however, one thing we did not discuss in the RNSA case is that the concentration. The concentration for HSA might be higher than that of RNSA and that is why its intensity is much higher. So how to calculate the concentration? Like we have previously explained in the tyrosine part that if we know the epsilon value that is the molar absorption coefficient value at the specific wavelength that is suppose 278 for HSA or 270 or 280 for HSA or 278 for RNSA whatever it may be if the literature absorb molar absorption coefficient value are available we can actually calculate the concentration of the particular protein. So UV experiment is basically required for evaluating the concentration of protein. So apart from studying the structure, studying the nature of the amino acid present in the protein, one of the basic primary need of UV spectroscopy is determining the concentration of a particular protein. And the second part is that we will go to our fluorescence experiment. For fluorescence experiment as we have seen in the slides or rather in the fluorescence experiment as we have seen in the theory classes that you need an excitation wavelength and an emission range. And now what is the excitation wavelength? Basically the excitation wavelength is the maximum absorption of the protein which, uh, which can be seen in the UV visible spectrometer. Now for obtaining the fluorescence spectroscopy or fluorescence spectra of a particular protein and the fluorescence spectra basically for a particular amino acid as we have seen in the theoretical classes. Basically here we need to know where to excite. We cannot actually arbitrarily excite at any arbitrary peaks and get the emission spectra. We have to excite at a particular range and where to excite we can actually calculate it by using this UV spectrometer. Now the absorption value where we can get the maximum intensity which is often called as lambda max we should excite here at that wavelength only. Now for RNSA we are getting an excitation around 278, we can excite around 278. However, for tryptophan, we can get an excitation wavelength of around uh, 278 and 280. However, the excitation wavelength for tryptophan varies a bit, it is around 295 nanometer. Now we have taken the third protein, we have done with RNSA and HSA and now the third protein is lysozyme. This lysozyme contains tyrosine as well as tryptophan and now, now let us see how the absorption spectra for this lysozyme protein looks like. Now let us uh, do auto zero. Now we can see the machine has calibrated itself. Now let us start the scanning for lysozyme. The protein we are using is Hainic white lysozyme protein. Here we can see the scanning is taking place out here. And one important thing to mention is do not click stop or do not open this chamber or the lead which I had shown earlier while the scanning is going on this will surely affect the lamp. And if you are uh, sure that you need to stop this one then only otherwise casually do not click this stop button. It is almost the scanning is over, however it will again get enabled here. Now we can see this part is around uh, absorption values around 0.2 and whereas it has crossed the upper limit, let us see uh, how much it has gone, 1.5, it is above 1.5. One important thing to note here, kindly do not uh, cross the absorbance value of around 1. As we have seen from your theoretical classes, Lambert's Beer law is applicable 
do not cross this value above 1 as we have seen from uh, theoretical classes Lambert's weird law is only applicable for absorption value less than 1. So, better try to keep your solution below this 1 value and if it sometime crosses 1 dilute it so that the absorption value for this part is below 1 and we are not bothering about this one because currently we are interested in finding the concentration from this spectra this peak. So, this one here we have got it for lysozyme it has come into around 282 we can see a broad peak out here. So, first let us save this one lysozyme solution 1 in the spectrum file again save as in the data printable file. Now, we are enabling lysozyme along with RNSA and HSA solution. Interesting to note down here is that in both cases HSA and uh, lysozyme. So, first let us consider with lysozyme and uh, HSA we are disabling this RNSA. So, lysozyme and HSA we can see this uh, upper part this black one is for our lys uh, lysozyme part. So, if we change it then point 0.4 here we can see this part is lysozyme this upper part and the lower one is for HSA and now coming to RNSA here we can see this is RNSA. So, 3 defined proteins 3 defined absorption spectra and the important thing is here from this absorption spectra we can calculate the concentration or we can uh, know the excitation wavelength from the lambda max value. Now, we are done with the UV visible absorption spectroscopy part. And after you complete this experiment, two things to note is that whether you have saved the data in the computer as we have seen. So, it is better to save the data after once you have taken the absorption spectra. And number two, the most important part which many of us tends to forget is that we need to clean the cuvette which we have used for our measurements. So, we have to open this lid, take out the two cuvettes, the front one and the back one and now discard the solution out here. So, place the cuvet in such a way that the frost side touches the tissue paper. Now, one thing to recommend is that whenever you are using this cuvet, whenever you are placing this cuvet always try to place it on a tissue paper. This is generally known as the tissue bed for cuvet. Do not place it in the table or in any sort of uh, glass plate or whatever be the case always place it on a clean tissue paper. Now, after that we have to clean all this quite a few times. With ethanol solution and followed by acetone and dry this one. Otherwise, after washing this one, we have to gently keep it, keep this cuvette in a tissue paper for drying.